I am so glad to be able to e-meet all of you and hopefully one day can actually meet you all in person soon as well. So I will actually share my screen now. Okay, we are... All right, uh, is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah, I think. Okay, uh, great. So I started my uh, work in the field of sustainable development when I was eight years old. And when I was 12 years old, I founded Green Hope Foundation. And my mantra at Green Hope and also just that of Green Hope Foundation is to empower my peers, the children and youth who are amongst the largest stakeholders of civil society by using education for sustainable development as a transformative tool. Our work is our worship and through it we pay obscience to the divine. Now the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that I spoke about in the earlier webinar has given us the plan to address the world's most pressing problems from poverty to gender inequality, climate change, inequalities, peace, and social injustices. But as with all policies, its greatest challenge lies in uh, its implementation and to ensure that it reaches every single person, especially those who need it the most. So at my organization, Green Hope Foundation, we work on facilitating this last mile of action by adopting a bottom-up approach that seeks to engage the world's most marginalized and vulnerable communities, those whom the world has forgotten, as their inclusivity is key to an equitable and sustainable world order. Now these goals have a target date of 2030 and we are now in the last decade of action, literally. So it's really our only chance to redress these issues before we cross the threshold of no return. The overarching objective of the SDGs, as I mentioned, is to create a world where no one is left behind, where everyone has equal access to opportunity, to peace and to the same rights of expression. But the question is, how can we create an equitable society and achieve peace when there is so much inequality? There are millions of children who don't have access to the basic amenities that we take for granted from education to proper sanitation. So through our academies at Green Hope Foundation, we seek to engage these children uh, in the Syrian refugee camp in the Beka Valley on the Lebanon-Syria border, uh, the children in the Rohingya refugee camp, 1.5 million people who live there on the Bangladesh-Myanmar border, uh, for children of prisoners in Kenya and Nepal, for children in orphanages in Suriname, Kenya and Nepal in Indonesia, for children living in homes for HIV positive people in Nepal. And we have seen the same unbridled passion and love for mother nature in all of them and the urge to actually work and look towards a just, harmonious and peaceful future. The current pandemic, as we all have heard so many times, has exposed starkly the fault lines in our infrastructure and just in our society as a whole. And as with all other disasters, it has a greater impact on the vulnerable, those who are already bearing the brunt of poverty. So rather than get cowed, we at Green Hope look at this as an opportunity to build back better. Our teams are working at a grassroots level to organize food distribution and other essential items, like, for example, just day before yesterday, to celebrate Eid. Our chapter in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, did 
a handout of food rations to the underprivileged families living there. So we continue our environmental education programs for schools digitally. We have brought experts on the SDGs together at our webinars for them to share their thoughts on how to take the sustainable development goals forward and how to take their implementation forward. And our most important takeaway from these webinars has been the need for multilateralism, the importance of collaboration in order to bridge the social and economic divide as we embark upon the last decade of action. Peace and sustainability are two sides of the same coin. One cannot be achieved without the other. What is now most important and should always be important is that we have inner peace. Only one, when we have that inner peace can we go about bringing about world peace. And the word peace is not just a five letter word. It is the collective responsibility of individuals, the private sector and governments to work towards achieving peace. And we need to solve the world's problems of hunger, poverty, lack of education, and so many more. And it's really sad that this pandemic has asked, uh, once we had this pandemic, we've suddenly woken up and seen all the stark inequalities in our world. But the truth is, as was said by so many of our panelists, it has always been there, these inequalities, and it's really time for us to learn from the mistakes that we've made and really build back better and create a new normal, not go back to business as usual, but really work on achieving peace and sustainability and just human rights for all so that together we can build back better and create that just, equitable, harmonious, and peaceful world that we also desperately want to achieve. So on that note, I will open the floor for comments and questions and just to hear your perspectives on how really we can achieve peace, uh, harmony, and sustainability. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Kikesha. That's great. So we'll just open it up. Whoever would like to um, share a question or thought for Kikesha. I have a question. I, I am blown away by your scope and the, our deep kind of rootedness in your activism. Who were your models? How did you get to just tap into that so clearly? So I am born on 5th June, that's World Environment Day. So I always thought that I was preordained to become an eco-warrior and save our planet from total annihilation. So uh, when I was seven, I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic. And that was extremely disturbing to me because seeing a dead animal anyway is disturbing to anyone. But what I couldn't understand was why that bird had to die and the, the pain and agony the bird must have gone through as it choked on that plastic. And it was also around that time that I attended a lecture by environmentalist Robert Swan, whose words, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And that really resonated with me. So I decided that I would start my green journey at the age of eight on my eighth birthday by planting my first tree. And as for role models, I grew up seeing my parents and my grandparents and even my great grandparents just being a stewards for the environment and for society. And I thought that that was what, that was the normal, that every single person would give back to the community, would take care of the environment. But at seven, at eight, I realized that that was not the case. So I decided that someone had to do something and that is why uh, I, I decided I'd be that person to 
uh, slowly work towards bringing about that change, especially through the involvement with the involvement of children and young people. Awesome. Thank you, Kikesha. So Lucille, do you have a question or thought to share with Kikesha? Oh, I'm just gonna un I'm gonna ask you to unmute Lucille. You're still muted. Okay. You can hear me? No, we can, yes. Um, I was just thinking, speaking from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, have you had any contact with um, the hero, hero from Norway, Greta Thunberger, because you seem to be having the same mission or the inspiration um, to change the world? I have not because our work is very much focused on ground level actions working with uh, children, especially who have literally no means of protesting or striking because they don't have food to eat or they don't have they don't yeah. go to school and have so many other problems. So our work has never been about striking or protesting. What we talk about is localizing the sustainable development goals and solutions and understanding that every single region and country and uh, space really has their own solutions. So. Uh, we work specifically on engaging uh, children in marginalized and vulnerable communities and empowering them uh, to bring uh, about change and become leaders in their own zones of influence. And we do that through dance, music, art, uh, really creative ways of communication so that every single per uh, person and every single child has that self-empowerment to bring about positive change through ground level action. Okay. Well, welcome to Cape Town next time you're in Africa. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. So, Thank you. Will? I, I have a question, uh, Keke Sean. I am so inspired by what you're bringing forward. And I wondered, uh, you gave a beautiful invocation. I wondered if you could speak about what you see as the role of religion in terms of actually getting it to fulfill the call of the scriptures and be really become a strong support for the work that you're doing and the work that's needed. How do you see the religious leaders or communities getting engaged in a, in a, in a really skillful way? In all of the work that I've done and all of the teachings that I've gained, I've seen that every single religion and every single spiritual belief preaches that we love one another, we love Mother Earth, and we should be at one and be in harmony with uh, each other. So I think that uh, religion, the interfaith dialogue, it's absolutely crucial in uh, understanding our world's problems and then also figuring out the solutions to solve the world's problems. And it really uh, brings uh, together uh, and really uh, preaches our common humanity because I was raised with the belief that my religion is humanity and to give equal uh, love and respect to every single religion and spiritual belief. And uh, I, I have learned so much from every single religion about how we can really work towards achieving that peaceful and sustainable world. So I have always seen how important and how crucial it is to uh, include the interfaith dialogue and to include religions uh, when we talk about achieving sustainable development and world peace. Thank you. That's that's very inspiring. Kesha, we have um, we have two boys. We have about five six minutes left. Just so you know, timing wise, um, we have two boys that have been involved in our little project. You know, the Mad Hero Project, and we started from the time they were small, just because that's kind of our wanting them to be engaged in the world and interfaith has very much been a part of our world kind of exposing them to all different faiths what would be your advice to a young person that's starting off and wanting to engage in the world your experience at a, such a young age how did you kind of mobilize um, your warrior vision i always say that the most important thing to have is passion and love 
for uh, what you want to do. And once you have that, there is really no stopping you from, uh, nothing stopping you from achieving that uh, dream. So in my case, my passion was to achieve the just and sustainable world by leaving no one behind. And I did not let my age or any other barriers that came my way uh, stop me from achieving that goal. And uh, we work with so many children and young people from all walks of life. And I have seen that same passion reflected in their eyes, that same love for Mother Nature, for uh, and the urge to achieve uh, world peace. So, I, and I have just realized that, you know, once you have that, you can really uh, move forward and achieve uh, whatever you want to achieve. And yeah, I think, and uh, apart from that, having positivity, honesty, hard work, these are extremely important and just being, uh, just really help you to be a good person and a good human being. And yeah, and uh, I've always been taught that whatever comes from the heart stays. So uh, if they're passionate about something, I'm sure that they will be able to find some way to uh, overcome all obstacles and achieve their dream. Thank you, Kakesha. Anyone else, Sarah, do you have anything else to add or Lucille? I actually did have another question. So I was listening to your speech and I was thinking about Joanna Macy's work and I was wondering if you have bumped up against that work. Um, it is the work of um, properly recognizing and grieving um, the, the sort of what's happening in the natural world as well as the the embodying on the human level, the emotion that it brings up inside of us to um, to come to that place of calm and stillness and rest and peace, no matter if we have adequate food, water, shelter or not. Absolutely. Uh, we have worked with several uh, spiritual leaders who've actually taught us how to, uh, you know, bridge that gap and really uh, like bring out that inner peace and inner uh, well understanding of all of the world's issues no matter where we are so uh, yeah absolutely and we actually organized a webinar that had some of the world's most uh, prominent uh, leaders in, in this exact field and it was so calming and uh, wonderful to listen to them talk about why it's so important that we connect with that inner self and that inner peace and how that is really going to help us to understand and work on solving, uh, well, the natural problems, social problems, uh, and just the world's problems in general. So yes, absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, Kakesha. I just, you know, as a mom, um, just congratulations. You know, this is not, it's, it's a challenging time, but it's a challenging world that we're dealing with. And congratulations on all the success and just uh, sticking to your vision. And I love that you were born, you know, on a day that made you feel like a warrior forever. That's a really beautiful story. I think Will has something else to add in our last two minutes. Well, I just want to thank you, Kakesha. I am very inspired by what you've brought forward. And I feel that what you're speaking to is really an inspirational flame that really every human soul has in them somewhere. And so I recognize what you're speaking to because it's also been my own story. Once I got connected with the flame of my life, I love the question you raised, Sarah, because we've worked extensively with Joanna Macy over the years and with the work that reconnects in our own work. I think it's a very important part of it. So I just want to say uh, more power to you. I want to support your work. And we have these international conferences, both online and in person. And we will definitely invite you, Keika Shah, to present um, at those conferences in the future, because I, I just feel such resonance with what you're bringing forward. So bless you, bless your work. And it's just wonderful to meet you and have your contribution to this gathering. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's really so wonderful to be amongst like-minded people. And it really just gives me hope for uh, that better future that we are all talking about. So thank you so much. And you give us all hope. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kikisha. Thank you so I think much. everyone's joining us now. 
Um, thank you so much, honey. That was beautiful. Fabulous.